Okay, so today we have mainly uh, machine learning we will cover. Um, and basically we will go through all of the notebooks here in uh, today's lecture and the uh, other lecture this week. So we will go a lot faster than sort of usual speed. Okay. So what I've also done is uh, added a, a second assignment. It's sort of easy. It's mainly just to make sure that uh, everyone is able to do some minimal things because when you finish this, uh, and you do all the stuff, you might get a certificate that you can put in LinkedIn and it will have pointers to this course and say that you know certain things. So I wanna make sure there's sort of some absolute basic minimal requirements that everyone sort of meets because the assignment one, as you saw, was quite simple. Because <laughs> we're also testing the auto grader in the back end. It's the first time we're sort of trying to auto grade it. So this one, what it does basically is, uh, I realize some of you didn't um, go and read stuff on your own. So I'm kind of twisting your arm a tiny bit. But it's not too bad. So I, I talked to a bunch of students and we decided that maybe all you have to do is at least three transformations and at least three actions in detail. And this is kind of a long notebook, but it's just this visual um, uh, API, right? So it has transformations and actions that uh, Jeff made. And we saw some of this already embedded through the notebooks. I've just dumped all of them here, some animations, right? Um, so Suprarak, who's helping with the auto grading for this course, uh, did a lot of this. Anyway, you can go through this. It sort of gives you the keys, um, transformations and actions. And here are the core uh, um, Spark operations that are sort of transformations and actions of different levels of difficulty, right? So we saw map filter, flat map. We didn't quite see map partitions, map partition of index. Um, yeah, we saw different things, but not in detail. So uh, it might be good to try out at least three of the ones we haven't tried in class. By try out, what I mean is simply go through, um, I don't know, um, say, well, we already did map. So here there is some code. So if you see code for a cell, you can just type the code you see and, and then try to comment and say something about, uh, what you think is going on, right? So if you want, you can always uh, go further, like go to the Spark code. I put links for the RDD on the top and then try to kind of make sense of it. You know, what is it doing beyond the sort of operation, right? And I kind of showed last time, those of you who missed it can watch the first few minutes of the video, I think I sort of showed you how to, how to kind of deep dive into the code for distinct. Um, yeah, so this will be peer reviewed. What does this mean? We're just gonna let each other look at stuff and, and your main goal is to sort of show that you've understood it. And this is for yourself, right? So like say two months after not doing any Spark and Scala code, you yourself come back to this notebook. It won't make a lot of sense, you forget it. You know, this, is, this happens to me all the time. So it's also for like helping you get back into this in more detail in the future which is the same as getting someone, one, one of your um, classmates, you know, peer review. So it's just, um, yeah, just try some stuff. Some of the things I've already said, we've done this in lab lecture. So there's only a few image ones. You can sort of so group by, for example, or something you can fit into. Try to do Scala. Um, the Python code is here. If you want, you can also do percent Python mainly focus on Scala because it's just easier to understand the source code. Okay, that's assignment two. Uh, we will post it. So you should, if you uploaded the, the notebooks, you should have them here. As you can see, it's quite a lot. Uh, I hope to, let see. I hope to get at least to 020 today. A lot of this will be homework, how quickly march through. Um, so one thing I wanted to um, start, start with, oh shoot, I didn't start the cluster. Okay. So 
Yeah. So. Okay. So while while the cluster is starting, I will go through package cells. But before that, let me give you uh, an overview of what the machine learning pipelines are and where you should really be reading to, to supplement the lectures, right? Um, so let me start here. So those of you who have taken machine learning, statistical ML, like you guys in data science, a lot of this will be very fresh in your mind. Those of you who have not done it, and want like a 15 hour crash course, you can do it in eight hours, almost double speed, but 10 hours, 1.5 speed. So this is a really great resource. Uh, it's uh, these guys from Stanford, uh, Trevor Hasty and Rob Tipsharani. They're, uh, you know, very um, famous professors in, in statistics and machine learning. So they do this incredibly, uh, intense 15 hours of expert videos. So it's quite a good resource to have. Okay, so it sort of starts with basics of what is statistical learning, um, linear regression, classification, sampling methods, uh, linear model selection, regularization. So we will see all for all of this first six chapters today, right? So uh, I'm not going to be able to teach this entire course again, but uh, we'll mainly focus on how to how to do these things in Spark at scale. But the ideas uh, are, are are here, and I'll mention. You know, if you have questions, ask me. You know, what does something mean? Uh, and then we'll also see tree-based methods later on. Probably not today, but it's in the same uh, machine learning library pack. And we will actually start with unsupervised learning first. Okay? So do people know what is uh, what is the basic idea behind machine learning? What is unsupervised learning and supervised learning? Know this, okay, good. Um, and what's the difference between uh, regression and classification? Okay. So do you know, Kieran? Do you know the difference? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I mean, if you don't know, you can always ask. So it's not like, um, all right. There are other books I linked here. I would say um, these are these are really great resources. I would say this one is uh, one of my favorites. So uh, this is Kevin Murphy. I think he went to Google recently. Um, so this is a, a really good set of three books. Uh, so he wrote this book called Machine Learning, a Probabilistic Perspective in 2012. So I have, I have a hard copy of this. And then this one is Probabilistic Machine Learning an Introduction 2022. And then this is the advanced stuff. So you can actually check all this. It's MIT licensed, it's in GitHub as well. So you can kind of, yeah, um, it's quite good. Okay, so these are the resources. Um, yeah, so, uh, so these are the kinds of problems we will see. So facial recognition, link prediction, uh, there's something wrong with my, uh, yeah. Markdown really sucks with uh, this interface. It's sort of always, it's very sensitive. So it sometimes doesn't work <laughs> with the slightest, uh, See. Anyway, so you know all about this. Um, so in supervised learning versus unsupervised learning, what we what we really do is uh, in supervised learning, there is actually a, a supervisor that has gone through the, the, the learning problem, which just means that for every question or feature, the supervisor already gives you an answer or a label, right? So images of cats and dogs, someone already comes and says it's a cat, it's a dog and so on. But a lot of problems, you won't have this uh, supervisory structure. So you won't have labels necessarily. So then what you want, what you can do, one of the things you can do is unsupervised learning. And um, in unsupervised learning, you're basically trying to learn the structure and the data uh, as, uh, as in and of itself, right? So that's, um, you can, you can look at this, um, um, 
this little video if you, if you don't know the stuff. So for us, we will mainly focus on ML pipelines, as I said. So, so machine learning pipelines, I think this is a link to the programming guide. And um, yeah, so we will mainly focus on, on this. So there is a concept of pipelines and pipeline uh, components come in uh, two different types, transformers and estimators. And in some sense, a pipeline essentially puts together uh, a whole bunch of um, um, transformers and estimators in a sequence uh, to build a pipeline, right? We, we will see examples of this, but that's sort of uh, super high level. So let's look at some pictures. So the, the, what you should be reading uh, for background for your allocated time is actually this book, which is one of the three recommended readings for the course. So this is uh, Spark the Definitive Guide. So you have to be logged into the, our library because O'Reilly charges you, you know, for every page view. <laughs> So yeah, you, yeah, so there are some PDFs of older versions of this book's in circulation, but it's better to just, yeah, be logged into the library. So here is the main idea. So we have, uh, you know, some kind of a raw data that is available uh, in some database, CSV file, or it could be a whole bunch of movie files or whatever, or the JSONs. And then we uh, pre-process, clean, and do some feature engineering of it. It's kind of the first step. And to do this, we generally will use various transformers and estimators. So these are formal uh, um, uh, yeah, structures in, in Spark. So a transformer basically takes an input and transforms it to, to an output. And uh, all the columns that come with the, with the data will usually be preserved upon transformation. So it simply adds new columns, new output columns. And uh, an estimator uh, is very much the same, except it can actually uh, build something from the raw data. Okay, so you, you do clean and structured data, and then you have um, using estimators and uh, fitting the estimators, uh, you get models. And then uh, you do something for um, cross validation because you need to basically, in, in at least in a supervisory setting, you split your data into training and test sets. And then you may actually tune some hyperparameters and uh, that can be done by a cross validation. And in Spark, you can do this in a distributed way. So it's a lot faster. So that process is called hyperparameter tuning or just tuning. And then you evaluate how well, how well your model is doing, right? And then finally, you would serve these models, okay? So this is kind of the, the sort of high level view of various uh, concepts in the machine learning, right? So this is basically what a transformer does. It takes a data frame and uh, some columns are named as input. And then um, the transformer say, you know, is told how exactly it should transform the input columns. And then it produces uh, a set of named output columns and basically adds extra columns, and then out comes another data frame. Right? Um, so anyway, it's, it's, it's quite nice. So the, the book actually has a lot of code bits and stuff. So I've embedded some of them maybe in some more detail in the notebooks later. Um, so, so anyway, this, this, is a, this is a very good resource. So. Let me see. So we will get into unsupervised clustering soon. But before that, let me tell you something about package cells. It's sort of a detour, but kind of a good detour to have in mind. So when you actually code in, in, a, in, a, in a Spark library, right? So, so sorry, when you, when you write Spark code, say Scala, then uh, often when, when the notebook environment gets too complex, you know, say you're, you're essentially starting to build something that's not out of the box, okay? This, this can happen on any project, any realistic project. So then what you normally do is you would build uh, essentially a library locally, a package uh, locally, and then you will build this jar 
you know, using say this dockerized environment or something like this with the build tool like SBT or whatever. And then this package jar, you can upload it to Spark. So this is the standard way and we will do this later. I mean, we won't build libraries, but we will at least uh, upload, upload jars very soon, okay? So to upload jars, that's fairly straightforward. You would just go and say import library and so on. But often what is nice in this notebook environment, this REPL environment, is to actually prototype a package in the notebook itself, okay? So that you can see if this sort of makes sense. And uh, so yeah, I must warn you before I show you this, this convenience, it's really bad habit to do this, okay? For many, many reasons, <laughs> particularly cost, because right now Databricks is paying for the DBU units, so it's okay, we're learning, but you know you should also be mindful of not getting too hooked on this because it's so much simpler to do this all locally actually, okay? Uh, but of course the advantage of doing it in the notebook is that when we wanna try something out quickly on a very large data set for some behaviors on big data, then it's nice to be able to prototype here, right? So it's, uh, it's good and bad. So what are packet cells? They're just special cells that get compiled when executed in the notebook environment, okay? And um, so these cells have no visibility with respect to the rest of the notebook. So you have to formally import it. So you can think of them as separate Scala files. The entire package cell, which is just one cell of the notebook, is basically like isolated Scala file, okay? And uh, there are some, 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 some nice things with them. So for example, let's define this class. Okay, so case class, this is a case class called test key. So I define it like this, right? There will be some, some obscure bugs you come in this sort of REPL environment if you don't use package cells uh, in some cases. So that's this example, okay? So then what we're going to do is after defining this case class called test key, Okay, uh, I'm going to create an RDD. Maybe this is too small or okay, slightly bigger. Yeah, I'm going to create an RDD. Uh, so sc.parallelize, and then I'm giving it an array where the first element in the array is this test key. The second element is a string BSS, right? Here again, the first element is this test key. So I'm using the case class test key as a key in my sort of uh, tuples of uh, array that's getting parallelized. And then I want a group by key, right? So group by key should simply bring all the elements in an array buffer of uh, these strings, right? And then it's basically group by key. So let me group by key and collect. So, and remember case class actually is supposed to match if two elements are the same by value, right? It's not like your usual class. So, so here note that I have test key 1L and ABD and test key 1L and a, ABD, they're the same, same key by value comparisons, right? But what happens is uh, you actually get this test key 1 ABD, test key 1 ABD as two, as though they are two separate keys, right? So something is not quite registering here, right? Um, so yeah, that's the, this is one of these weird behaviors you get in notebooks if you don't use package cells for, um, for certain, you know, certain operations. So, but let's say if we, if we do this, if we, if we say, uh, package, we can put anything here, com.databricks.example, um, say is that a, is a package naming convention. And then, then I put taste class, so case class test key. Uh, so if we do this, now one thing you do immediately notice is there's this warning that says classes defined within a package cannot be redefined with a, without a cluster restart. So this is a problem, okay? <laughs> We're sort of locked into it, uh, but it actually now is, is compiled and it's available. This whole package is available. So you can, for example, import this package, okay? Import com.databricks.example. And then you do exactly the same thing. And so now basically you are going to get exactly your desired behavior. You know, so there's only one pesky one ABD. 
So this is a, a very weird notebook level behavior that you, you should be aware of, okay? Um, okay, so these cells behave, yeah, as individual source, source files, therefore only classes and objects can be defined inside these cells. So here's another example. Um, yeah, package x dot y dot z, a number is five, and then uh, this is not going to work because you can only have, um, have uh, classes and objects inside this package. Okay, so, so what you can of course uh, wrap it in an object called utils and then it's fine, okay? Um, so then you can call the vector importing like this. So this is uh, something uh, that's sort of notebook specific and um, okay. So anyway, I don't want to, yeah, there are some tricks, right? So if you want to restart, you can always change the name a tiny bit and then things will work if you want to play around. So I won't go too much more into it, uh, but basically, this is sometimes quite handy. And you've already used a package, the IvanD3 package for graph visualizations. I don't know if you did that notebook. I didn't do it uh, last time, the Wikipedia click streams. There you're using this uh, package that's built locally. Right? So that you know you can call this graph making uh, object in this, from this package all over the notebook once you've compiled it using a package cell. So that's like another, Easy use. Okay, uh, let me. So before um, we go too much further, I want to briefly introduce, uh, you know, some simulation ideas. Uh, of course, most of you know all about simulation. Um, that basically, we will we will roll our own sort of bivariate regression from scratch before we start getting too deep into the. ML library, so I just wanted to touch um, on simulation. So, <clears throat> yeah, so you know, this is uh, a lot of it goes back to von Neumann's uh, rejection sampler, right? It's called the fundamental theorem of simulation. So, anyway, you have continuous distributions, and the way you do simulation is by simply looking at the transformation of them, right? So, if you can invert it, if you look at the distribution function. Uh, for say uniform, then then if you can basically invert it, um, then you can simulate from it. If you simulate uniform zero one this way, then you can simply invert it and get samples uniformly distributed on AB. Right, and the idea generalizes to to invertible distribution functions. Right, okay, if you can't do that, the other one you can try is rejection sampling. Um, these are basically the most elementary ideas for sampling from distributions, right? And then the others are usually dependent ones. So in Scala, uh, there is this Breeze uh, package that uh, is used, uh, Spark uses it as well. So it's not like as exhaustive as say Python or Java families, but it's, uh, it's, it's good enough to understand a lot of things. And, uh, so let's play with Breeze briefly. So if you suppose on distribution, for example, and you would just import Breeze and uh, simply, this is how you would create a Poisson random variable, um, new Poisson three, it's mean is three, and then you can just uh, create an immutable called S and sample five times from this. So this is kind of, um, yeah. you can, um, yeah, so get, you can also get probabilities for Poisson samples like this. And um, yeah, you can also get um, mean and variance of 1000 samples and so on. Okay. So Poisson mean and variance is the same as mean, variance the same as the mean. Same with exponential. Um, so if we have exponential, you can create a, a class expo new exponential, and then this is the rate parameterization. And okay, so, um, yeah. So, and then once again, you can also ask for probabilities. 
So we will use these little, um, yeah, breeze library throughout. We might simulate random graphs later on. Uh, pretty soon we will simulate some samples for a regression, um, sort of noisy points on a plane. That's the main reason I'm doing this. Okay. Um, yeah, so this is the same idea, drawing samples from an exponential. Yeah. So once again, mean and variance of say thousand samples. So the next thing is, so that's pure uh, breeze. It's all like, you know, it's not distributed or anything. So how do you do pseudo random numbers and spark in a, in a, in a distributed setting? So now I want to simulate, I don't know, 800 billion, not, not on our clusters, but say something large, if we can keep increasing the number of nodes, how do you do it? Um, the idea is fairly simple. So it's all built in now in the SQL uh, library. So it's in SQL functions. So you can, for example, uh, create a data frame, uh, thousand numbers, and then um, call the call them ID. So it'll be zero, one, two, three, four, like this, so on. So then I can basically say df.select ID, and then I could simply say rand and set a seed and simply get as many random numbers as I want. Okay, so these are just random numbers between zero, one, and well, if you can simulate points between zero, one, you can transform it. Okay, um, so that's basically uh, the idea. So there are a bit of details depending on how. Uh, so, I mean, I think a great exercise would be, oh, by the way, for this little thing, probably don't have RAND here, but I did mention that you can always look at things that you want that's not in one of these images. So for example, it might be a very good idea to dive deep into RAND. Exactly how RAND is implemented in Spark SQL uh, is something very important to know because there are some details on how the partitions are. Remember there are partitions, Right now, what did I do? I, I put a bunch of stuff. I think my my mich my cluster default creates two two partitions. I think so. There'll be a bunch of numbers, right, uh, in in two partitions. And then if I, I I set the seed outside, right, but then how is that? But then you know if I if I were to wait for that seed to be initialized in the standard pseudo random number sequence way, then I have to start from this guy and iterate through all of the elements in the first partition and then move here and so on, right? But of course, it will be really good if I could somehow use the seed, one seed, to initialize somehow different seeds in each partition and then, and then in parallel start my PRNG, right? Do you know what I mean? It, 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 because otherwise, you know, if you have lots of partitions, you're gonna wait for the whole thing to be sequential, right? So, there's, so Spark is doing something and uh, a really good example of a deep dive is to figure out how, how it's actually taking the seed you specify and mapping it across partitions. So I thought maybe to make this a bit more like live, maybe, maybe next time we meet, um, uh, one of you can actually spend a few minutes taking over the, the Zoom and you know explaining what's going on with RAND, right? Should we do that? Brand's not too hard. Distinct was more messy. Okay, let's do that. So that's like a, <laughs> don't worry. Don't, yeah, don't, you know, if even, yeah, it should be okay. Yeah, to try it. I won't, uh, yeah, anyone, yeah. Um, so you can volunteer. So I won't randomly choose someone. Um, okay, so, uh, so here is, uh, yeah, so now what can you do? So you can actually, um, um, change the seed obviously and, uh, control your simulation this way. It's all I've done here. Uh, and, and we do want deterministically, um, right. So we, we definitely want this thing to be completely deterministic, so that's what I'm trying to show here. Um, because yeah, for pseudo random number generation and simulation, you want complete deterministic control of the simulation. So you can debug, for example. Okay, so this is, this is a bit more like 
mind bo mind bogglingly atomic way of doing this, but it's basically the same idea. So I have rand zero one with column one. I put a literal one with rate 0.5. I can put the literal constant 0.5. It seems really silly to think like this, but this is kind of how you want, you want to think in MapReduce. Even when you use SQL expressions later on to simplify things, that's kind of what is happening under the hood, right? Because in some sense, we can't escape from this basic pattern of map reducing yeah? if you want to scale arbitrarily. So that's what this basically does, right? So I'm, I'm basically, yeah, going through the process of creating a, an exponential uh, sample. Uh, so if you invert the exponential density, you get this formula, right? Minus one over rate times log of one minus u. The u is uniform zero to one. So, um, so this is sort of a, you can simplify this a little bit, but uh, but basically that's what um, that's that's basically how you sim simulate from arbitrarily as many as exponential samples as you want. Okay, and you can use SQL directly in Spark. So Spark implements this already for you. I think it implements exponential. Um, I think so. Um, but anyway, this is how you would do this. So now, um, yeah, this is quite big. I don't know. Let's see. Oh. Okay, so that was all done lazily, right? Now it's actually doing it. I don't know, maybe it was too much. Ah, one billion. Um, yeah, so we should get some statistics here. This is approximating pi with Monte Carlo simulations. Um, so, so this is uh, an example I took from somewhere online. So this is a little bit more involved, right? So you import Scala map random, and then you say how many partitions you want. And uh, um, you know, the idea is to basically create uh, um, you know, an RDD of samples uh, by mapping each I um, to random times two minus one. Um, so you basically, um, map the points into a two by two square and uh, do some, some filtering. And uh, this is your st standard way of computing approximation for pi, right? So slightly more involved. Um, but yeah, say you want to do something more fancy, like, uh, I don't know, like have an incredibly large uh, graph of say, of Sweden, say from OpenStreetMap. Uh, there is later on some notebooks you can use if you want. You can ingest all of OpenStreetMap, say for a whole country, and then build like a, a graph where every intersection that's in the OpenStreetMap is actually an intersection node in the graph. And then you can take the roadways and segment them to say 100 square, 100 meter lengths, and then call each segment a state. And then you can formally define a, a graph on this graph structure. And now imagine if you're trying to simulate a whole bunch of uh, interacting random walks on top of this. That'll be much more involved, okay? We will learn more about graph frames soon, uh, but, you, but there is actually a lot of simulations in, 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 in science uh, usually get to the point where you need distributed systems because you're trying to simulate very large systems. So then again, you have to take advantage of how to initialize seeds and so on in a partition specific way. And if it's a graph value thingy, I mean a graph structure, uh, once again, you, 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 you do use partitions in, in a careful way to minimize communications. We will see this later, um, but, um, but yeah, but every problem is, is, is very, very specific. Okay, so uh, you can do the same in Python and this is another example of Monte Carlo simulation and Scala. So uh, 
This one I got from some Google tutorial. Uh, it's quite cute. So it sort of plays a game and uh, you can play with this. I'm not going to go through this now. Okay, so just go through the rest of the notebook. That's just very quick introduction to a little bit of simulation we will need to, to create our own data sets. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm slightly old school, so I try to simulate data and make sure that the estimators actually match the simulation before trying it on real data. So it's good to do this at least if you, you know, to understand. Okay. So this is a really uh, well-known data set called the Million Songs data set from a Kaggle challenge. So um, the idea is to predict which songs a user will listen to, right? So, um, and I mainly yeah, took this uh, code from somewhere a while back and then I ma made a Scala, Scala version of this notebook. So let's see what this challenge is. So, yeah, this is the million song data set challenge. Uh, it has quite a lot of features for each song, and then you're basically trying to, um, you know, build some kind of a recommendation system. That's the main uh, end goal of this. So here, I think we are going to do some uh, some clustering, basically, which is a unsupervised learning method. Okay, so here is the, the steps. So we will do some extract transform load operations by parsing raw text and creating some tables or SQL data frames. And then we will explore the data, uh, mainly just through visualizations and SQL. Um, and then uh, we're gonna finally build a model uh, to cluster songs based on their attributes, okay? So this is, uh, and I'm gonna keep things uh, slightly lower level now. Later on, we will drop into, uh, into a higher level machine learning increase, okay? So here are the steps in, in ETL. So we will uh, read and transform the data, look at the schema, um, and then uh, play around with temporary tables. For exploration, we will use the, the built-in uh, uh, visualizations and then try to see if we need to do anything um, to transform the data before we uh, apply a uh, model to this. Okay? And then uh, with the model we're gonna try is just a simple k-means cluster. And does anyone know what probability model the k-means clustering assumes under the hood? I mean, you guys study k-means so many times in so many classes, no? Hmm. Okay, well, okay, maybe I'll assign that as an exercise so you can uh, next time, you know, you should look at Murphy's book, for example. Um, so anyway, the, the idea of K means is that there are K centroids around which the data points are, are clustered, okay? And you can sort of think about it as a sort of, yeah. Okay, I, I won't tell the probability model under the hood, but there is one explicit one under the hood. So uh, you can Google and find out. But basically the algorithm itself is sort of uh, not guaranteed to, to always find the right answer. So there are issues around it, but it works incredibly well if the data is highly structured. That means there's a lot of structure in the data, it'll quickly capture it. And often it's one first thing you should do, generally, if you don't know anything about the data. Okay, um, so let's... Um, Let's first check this out. So this is, uh, uh, so there's quite a few project students working on so many clusters right now. 
By the way, I would really like you all to, those who finish module one or even keep up with it, it'll be good to try and get you to form some groups, uh, you know, in preparation for module, module two and definitely module three will all be heavily group project because what would be nice is to get people to start talking and form groups of size, you know, less than four, four or less. So that, you know, you can, I don't know, work on things that you're passionate about, <laughs> okay? Because that is the most important thing from this course is to actually steer you toward uh, collaborative research on a, on, a, on a topic of your own interest, right? You have to make compromises because I don't know, you're into spiky neural, spiky neural networks. It was that guy, yeah, Karen studied uh, neurons, neuronal models for a long time. Um, so anyway, I think, uh, you, you know, maybe over the break, or maybe you should stop. I think it's good to chat and like chillax a bit like with, with each other, right? Uh, I don't know, people in Zoom will be harder, but so that I would like you to start thinking about forming teams. Uh, and then, you know, the sooner you know, what you want to do, and there is a project uh, you're roughly interested in, or you don't have to decide, then I can sort of get you onto this resource where you can now like, yeah, collaborate. Like, so you can all come together, see each other's notebooks and blah, 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 and also work on larger data sets. Right? So, okay, so this is uh, the data set. It has a header and Last time I showed you what these parts mean, right? So these are the, the different partitions are written in separate files, basically. So now let's, uh, let's collect this. We know the header is very small, so I can sort of safely collect and see how it looks. Okay, so there's quite a lot of stuff. Uh, when I collect it, I had an array of string. There's artist ID artist latitude and so on, um, right? So this is just pure, um, yeah, pure uh, array of strings, artist name, duration, blah, 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 right? And then it also has this uh, type information here. Um, so then I can look at uh, uh, two elements here. And then I only get these two, okay? So that looks all right. Uh, I can count. And it looks like there are 20, um, 20 elements in this array, right? There's sort of 20 attributes. Okay. Then um, I, can, I can collect and map this and print ln. So I'm doing this in the sort of very low level way, right? Because I'm only just operating on REVs and strings. <laughs> the reason I'm showing you this way instead of just like loading it as CSV or something is because it, it's good to know this because this kind of thing will always work, um, especially in an industrial setting because often data will just come in some kind of blobs or some, 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 you know, some custom format from some company or whatever. So it's important to be able to deal with it like this. Okay, so there is all the stuff. Okay, uh, what are we going to do? So we can basically um, take uh, take this uh, RDD sc.txt file and then map each line to um, basically. Uh, val header element. I'm going to split the line by colon because that's what I saw was uh, was here, right? And then I will know what the first element is. The first element is the header element. This is the second header element, zero and one. And then I'm going to collect. So now I made uh, uh, an array of the uh, name of the attribute and the type here, okay? So then uh, I can define a case class called song that'll be used to represent each row of the data in the file. So I'm gonna do this case class song, artist ID, blah, blah, blah. I hard coded this, right? I just basically copied it. Um, why? Well, 
this is basically yeah what you can do from scratch basically right um so now what you can do is uh now you see this data zero zero one part dash star so i'm going to read all of the the parts which are not the header the actual uh, contents and then let's see how much there is there's 31 39 um in data 01 so i'm only going to look at this and i can take three elements and start seeing various values for this oh shoot i should stop um Okay, so here is the rest, but we'll, we'll maybe stop here. So I'm kind of parsing like from scratch basically, right? Uh, so you guys know this <laughs> from intro to data science, but later on we will just load things faster, okay? We should do this at least once. Uh, okay, I'm gonna start. Uh, let's look at this um where are we we are basically somewhere here okay there is a this is a never-ending project but you can also view a lot of this in this book view so i'm kind of compressing the total number of notebooks now so there are fewer notebooks than in this earlier version when we did it last year for this uh, Wallenberg Autonomous Software Program PhD students. So it's basically, yeah. So you can always look here so that you don't need to log into Databricks to just like review concepts and things like this. So we're somewhere here, right? I think. So this is, uh, this is convenient. So if you get lost, you can whatever search. Um, song, okay. Um, so case class song or whatever. Anyway, I mainly did this as a challenge because it was uh, students started complaining like three years ago that they cannot remember everything in one module. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> people are changing in time. So in 2016, no one complained. They were like, wow, this is all these notebooks. It's amazing. But then over like a few years, <laughs> people wanted a bit more. Yeah, so, th so yeah, this is done using Rust and MDBook and yeah, now I'm trying to make each module a bit smaller because the search index that MDBook builds is so big that uh, I have some refugees in Africa who are trying to learn this content as well to do some service directly from the refugee camp. So their laptops are a bit smaller, so I'm trying to make the index smaller. So anyway, um, what I wanted to show you is this. So if you look here for projects, inspiration for projects, these were group projects done by the WASP AI track students from the 2020-21 instance. And uh, I don't know, there's about 22 projects. So um, they're not perfectly typeset, but so you can look at this one, uh, this, this group did um, on something they called the two cultures and they were mining Swedish flashback and uh, doing some latent directly allocations, the basic natural language processing and supervised learning method. It's, uh, yeah, anyway, they have notebooks for all of this and sort of, uh, it's hard to view um, with the nice pretty images here because they don't exist, but uh, you can get some kind of idea. They did logical, logistic regression and word to vec, uh, which is an embedding tip trick and then latent directly allocation. There are lots of other projects. So here's one on uh, something on finance that was interesting, maybe. Uh, I don't know. There's quite a lot of stuff. So there's one on thousand genomes. Um, there's another one. Yeah, and they all did little videos so you can kind of see this. Um, Let's say, for example, go here, financial streams. They did reinforcement learning for intraday trading. So you might you might be interested in this. Uh, I don't know. They uh, So they used a, a simple reinforcement learning module that you see later in Keras or TensorFlow, and then they sort of use some. So the idea is that when you do a project, okay, this has been removed. Uh, 
So yeah, so some, some projects may be still available, but the idea is that you make a video of your presentation and then, uh, you know, have some notebooks and, and present it as a team. Basically. Um, so yeah, here is their little, yeah. So, so there is a library we wrote for this uh, trend calculus with all the Brent crude oil and gold and all the 62 pairs of foreign exchange from this historical data in finance. It's one minute data. Um, you can do quite a lot of stuff with it. There's so many other examples. Um, so anyway, these are PhD students who did things that they wanted to do. They found uh, interesting and hopefully it'll give you some inspiration. Okay, so let's... Uh, so let's continue. So now what I have to do is somehow parse the line because I want to return a song. And the song is going to basically be tokens uh, split by tab characters. And then I'm simply going to convert, you know, leave strings as they are, but others I'm going to convert to double or whatever I need. So this is completely handled. Okay, it's not too many. So we can do this and uh, uh, yeah, get away with this. So then all I have to do is take the data RDD and then map the parse line uh, method. And, and then I can basically convert this to my data frame. Right? So that's it. So to go from an RDD to a data frame, all you need is a case class that does all the parsing for you. Right? And we can create a, a replace temp view and um, yeah, so, so now let's actually see if we can do something. And because everything is done lazily, <laughs> you haven't done anything, right? So we haven't actually tested it. So this is gonna fail. Uh, so this is a sort of common um, type of error. So it says task zero and stage 25 failed four times, most recent failure. By the way, I haven't showed you something important I should do. So right now we can go to the cluster where this job is called on, right? So here is this cluster. And if you go to, let me go here. And then you can go to Spark UI, okay? So Spark UI is generally where you look for uh, you know, look for details on what was, what's actually happening in this cluster, right? It'll give you the various jobs and, and, uh, and tasks and stages and so on. So you can actually look at stuff uh, like this. So it'll tell you uh, what is the, um, the command, um, you know, it, it's, it's all sort of, all of the details are here. So later on, we will maybe look at this in more detail, um, but, um, okay. So, so the problem is there because it's, you know, okay, it's hard to read from this, but basically it's because there is a conversion error, right? So at Scala collection immutable string like to double, um, there is a parse double, uh, problem here, right? So, yeah. So what is uh, the problem? Um, the parse line function uh, has issues. So what we need to do is to explicitly convert uh, this double. So I'm gonna now make the parse line method a bit more robust. So I'm gonna define another method called two double that takes the string and the default value double and then returns a double by doing try catch and exception handling. You, you should know how to do this so the first step as a data scientist because you, yeah, exceptions will happen all the time. <laughs> so this is just uh, exception handling. Okay, so now if, if we, you know, this is one way to do it, we can give it the default value. This is kind of dangerous uh, in general, but we can, can do it like this. More a standard thing would be to, um, to you know, to to basically um, use like option uh, in Scala, so 
later on more sophisticated libraries we will use, for example, for getting all the financial data, uh, processing all of this, uh, we use better patterns for exception handling. For now, let's do this the same with two int. Um, so now we're gonna use this two double and two int as opposed to directly trying to do it. That way, um, if things go bad, we, we, yeah, so here two double, um, we get default zero. And uh, two int also we get default zero. Okay, so now let's try this. Did I do this? Yep. Okay, so now I've cached this table and then I can um, look at the 10 values here. Um, so it looks like there is quite a lot of uh, information that's missing, right? Artist latitude, longitude, and so on. So that was our main problem. So exception handling just maps it to zero. So we can sort of see stuff here, on this name, song duration, and loudness, release. Uh, yeah, it's quite a lot of information title, year, and so on. So let's uh, continue with exploration. So here I'm basically putting everything together, right? So we went through things atomically, but this is the whole, everything done at once. So, Okay. And let's see what's here. So songs table should be here. Yeah. Okay, so um So we let's print the schema. Now we can see all the column values. And we have 31,369. So this is not the full 1 million stuff uh, because we're only looking at the, the first part. Okay. Um, so now let's select duration. Uh, and year from songs table. And so we can plot the uh, duration against the year just to get some idea of, uh... okay, so I don't know, it seems like it's slowly increasing. Maybe it was a bit higher. It's not. Okay, so you, yeah, you kind of think about these things and I don't know. Um, okay, so, so these two links are quite uh, useful to get into visualizations. Um, so uh, you can sort of chase them. Most of the time we will use this display environment. Um, we will sometimes like write the parquet file to um, yeah, the data frame to a parquet file or a delta file. And then we will jump into R or Python to use Python or R libraries for visualization because some, some visualization is very nice in these languages, okay? Okay, finally, um, let's do a bit of Um, let's try to predict which songs the user will listen to in this sort of very simple k-means sense. Okay. Uh, so once again, we put all of this stuff together. We, I mean, we don't have to keep doing this. We can also call percent run on a 
on a previous notebook. We will do that later because this is so small, we can do this. So now what I'm going to use from ML, um, Spark ML uh, library is this uh, feature um, engineering thing called the vector assembler. So the vector assembler will actually give me, uh, um, you know, it, it's a transformer. It'll take the input columns array, duration, tempo, loudness, and then set output column to be features. And then, um, and then I can uh, call the transform method on it and give it the table uh, songs table. Is it, no, as a so then uh, it's going to be um, my sort of. Um, because I, I want to, I want to give a vector of uh, in in a machine learning library. The features are usually a, a ML vector, either a sparse or a dense vector. So that's what I need a vector assembler for. Okay, and the labels are usually uh, um, a double. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah. So then we have basically transformed the table. Um, with this, and then I can get my training data. Uh, did I do a split yet? Mm. Oh, right, this is unsupervised learning. So that's my that's my data. <laughs> it's all of my data. Okay, so now when you look at uh, say you take three values, uh, you will start seeing that there is this. Vector assembler gave me this. Okay. Um, so this is basically the transformer I was talking about um, that machine learning library uses. Yeah, so it's an abstraction that includes feature transformers and it can also use learned models themselves. So when you take a model uh, and then you fit it, and then that fitted model itself behaves as a transformer because it can take new features and produce predictions right so it's it's a, an estimator upon fitting is a transformer okay so yeah it implements a method called transform it converts a data frame into another and you will see you'll see this again and again so uh, so estimator abstracts the concept of a learning algorithm so this is the same as uh, in mathematical statistics the the word estimator is used in a, in a precise way here as well. So an estimator will implement a method fit, which accepts the data frame and produces a model. And the fitted model is, is again a transformer, as I said. Okay, so what we are going to do um, is uh, do some, uh, what do I do? I thought I'm doing k-means clustering here. Okay, I am. <laughs> All right, so this is an example. Um, so yeah, so here we're gonna train, we're gonna take the training data, data frame, select these four things and limit to five. And let's just see how this looks, right? So we took duration, tempo, loudness, and then put it into a dense vector of length three, with these values. So that's all we've done. So this is the standard uh, algorithm for k-means. So you basically initialize, uh, so k is three here. So you initialize three randomly generated uh, points. So red, green, and blue. And then uh, you essentially have this algorithm where you, 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 you basically find the points that are closest to each of these centers and put them in a, in the cluster, so these are this point went to this. These green squares went here as the closest point, and these blue squares went here as the closest point. And this defines the three clusters. And then you, you do this very simple update step, right? So you uh, you basically use these points as uh, though they were really cluster points, and then you find the new centroid, and then update the old. Uh, yeah centroid to the new one. And you do this iteratively until there is convergence, right? This is the, um, so the, the most important point here is that uh, 
the k-means algorithm has this big caveat it's heuristic and there is no guarantee that it will converge to the uh, global optimum right so that if you if you start the algorithm at different initial conditions depending on the data it can go to very different cluster centers and, and, and terminate so it has yeah it's sensitive to initial conditions and can even um, have like oscillatory behaviors. So, okay, so here is, uh, yeah, some this explained in this flower, iris flower data set that uh, most of you may have seen already. Um, so here is the k-mean clusters uh, results. It says these are the three clusters. And then uh, this is the actual species from looking at the microscope and making sure they only mate with each other. Okay, so this is biology. So it can be completely wrong. <laughs> so just be careful. Um, yeah. Okay, so now with all that caveats, I already said that it's still quite useful, uh, at least if you kind of don't take it too seriously. Um, so here we do, uh, we import this um, Spark ML clustering k-means. So you can again look at the source code for this. Um, and then this is basically the syntax. So we say model new k-means set k2. So I'm only choosing um, two uh, clusters. And then I call the method fit on the training data. And the training data has already been pre-processed, right? Because it has the features column. So as long as there's a column named features, that's kind of the standard name that um, most of the uh, most of the models will be looking for. Okay. Uh, so I used a lot of other things. So the distance measure between points is Euclidean. That's the default, and uh, we know the number of features is three. Okay. So then you can actually ask for the cluster centers. Can kind of see the methods that are available to this model we just fitted. Also, there's distance explained params, and it's quite a lot of stuff. Right? Yeah. So, so you can see that these are the two centroids in three dimensional space. That's what's the number of features. So then we can do um, uh, model.transform. So we can give the training data back into the model, right? And uh, using the transform method, then we know which data point is in which cluster. Basically, right? so, uh, so then let's do, um, so I believe it gives us a column called, uh, I think it gives us a column called prediction or something. Uh, yeah, called predictions is the name of the last column. So now training data uh, is here, and then model transform dot print schema. So this is the one that just passed the training data back to itself called prediction. So then we can simply select duration, tempo, loudness, and then uh, prediction. Then we will kind of get an idea of where, which cluster each of these things are, right? Uh, so then we can transform. So now I'm gonna sample uh, false sampling without replacement, because we don't want all the 38,000 points. So we sample some fraction, we can change the seed to look at different samples uh, visually. Because this will give us a data frame and then we can essentially do some kind of a um, plot. So this is what uh, I've done already. So you can look at uh, how the uh, um, loudness, tempo and duration are clustered by the two, two colors. It to two clusters. So it seems like, 
Yeah, so here it looks, uh, it looks like loudness and tempo. There is a lot of overlap, right? Tempo and loudness. Loudness and tempo, these are just symmetric. Uh, but then, yeah, it, it's more or less like um, clusters nicely here. And so loudness, duration, and duration and tempo. So, so duration seems to have a, a much clearer split, right? So these are again it's just symmetric here. Okay. So. So, so we can also like basically look at the, the density um, uh, and see how, how the density uh, looks for duration and, and, and I think what I basically realize is, uh, well, maybe you need log of the duration uh, to, to see how uh, we could actually you know, deal with a sort of this concentration here. So maybe that could help. That's what uh, sort of I'll explain here. So now this is like transformation. So you do this. Uh, and I have my, uh, so yeah, you use this method called select expression, which is quite nice. So you can use pure uh, SQL commands like this. Uh, and then I'm gonna create my new vector assembler my array. Now I'm gonna use log duration, tempo and loudness and set out the column features. And then it's again, K means with two and then model two. So I'm gonna keep my old model as model and then transform to basically once the model is fitted, going to transform it and then I'm going to sample um, here. So this uh, this seems to capture uh, at least when, when, when we made this log duration, it seems to capture duration versus tempo here and uh, tempo versus loudness and versus duration. So it's uh it's it seems it seems that this helps. Okay. So anyway, you, yeah, the moral of the story here is that you may have to do transformations to basically be able to find more uh, distinct clusters. Okay. So what do you do? Yes, yeah, so there's a lot of other stuff like how do you determine the optimal K um, and how, why should you have two, why not three and so on. So there are, there are lots of methods of, of dealing with this. Simplest one, maybe you will hold back some of the data and then only do the clustering with uh, some of it and then use the held out to, to determine if it's, uh, you know, if, 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 if uh, K is too, too small or too big. But generally, um, yeah, K-means is used to find structure in the data. And if you, if you don't know anything about the data, it's often the first thing one would do. Right. So it can also be used for naive anomaly detection. So you, you say you take all of the traffic data in a big city and you do something super simple. I mean, I'm talking about every GPS trajectory of every vehicle you can measure and say like Madrid, people did this a few years ago. And then you're like, okay, what is this? So you featureize this somehow into very high dimensional space, but uh, you know, use some kind of graph clustering methods and so on. But at the end, you basically have a very high dimensional featureized representation of the state of the traffic. And then they did a K equals two, and maybe not so surprisingly, but very, very nicely what popped out is like, you know, in you know, one cluster, it's sort of normal traffic and the other cluster is like congestion, which kind of makes sense. 
So these kinds of very, very obvious structures can be usually picked out by k-means, although it's a heuristic algorithm that can get stuck and so on, right? So it's, it's not uh, useless. Yeah, and it uses quite a lot of uh, details under the hood. So if someone wants to dive into k-means, that's actually a fun thing to really dive into. Because what you have to do in k-means, if you have like billions of points and say even, say D is only whatever, two dimensions even, what do you have to do? You have to find, you know, for, the, for each of the cluster centers, you need to know who is the closest point to you. Right, at any given time. So that means so you have to basically do some kind of a, you can do some kind of very different K nearest neighbor search, for example. Right, and if you do that naively, that's like what, uh, if you have endpoints and three clusters, so you'll, you'll need to do how many comparisons. I mean, you just have to decide, for every point you have to decide which of the three clusters I'm closest to, right? And it's just that in the iteration, the clusters keep changing because you take the centroid again and again. So yeah, you have, yeah, n times k, right? So you have that many pairwise comparisons you have to do. So there are, uh, you know, there are several ways of like speeding up, um, you know, distance calculations. Um, so we, we may well, we, we may we may come to these uh, things at a lower level later. If people are interested. So let me let me go to the next method, which is our quintessential example of supervised clustering. So, um, so here we're going to look into uh, decision trees for handwritten digit recognition. So, this is also. Uh, yeah, uh, standard example. Um, so what are decision trees? So I think this is actually, uh, this got some NSF busy award. I don't know if this link still works, I hope it does. Yeah, it's, it's quite cute. So um, it's a visual introduction to machine learning by some data artist and some PhD student or master's student in Berkeley. So yeah. Yeah, you know, it's the San Francisco data, right? And it sort of gives you kind of look at this, adding nuances. And so, you know, you increase the number of dimensions like price per square feet. And uh, so you can sort of start drawing boundaries. So this is how the decision tree algorithm works, right? Elevation, you build bathrooms, bedrooms, price, and so on. And this is a pairwise scatter plot. So the algorithm basically yeah, it's quite cute. It just, yeah, you keep forking and then start splitting and so on. What I want to point out is this, and I, yeah, so most of you know this, but I really like this visualization. Um, so, you know, as the, as you keep splitting more and more, you can start seeing how the, how the points are falling. Um, you know, so here we split on elevation and price per square feet and so on, right? And, so this is also very interpretable compared to like a standard deep learning algorithm. So people like it in the insurance industry and things like this, right? because you have to somehow explain why you don't offer a loan to some human being, especially in Europe. Yeah, and then it sort of, and then you can, once you build a tree, it, it, you can drop the data points into this sort of partition and it just sort of keeps going down and, and, and yeah. Um, so this is, I think, completely overfitted. Uh, so then, you know, what you do is if you fit the data completely, then of course, for your training data, this is pretty cool. Uh, yeah, for your training data, all the points will, you know, will actually fit exactly to the label. So normally you actually, uh, uh, you know, take only some of the data, hold some back, and then you would actually also use the, the total depth of the tree as a parameter, as a hyperparameter that you tune with your held out data so that you can use the held out data to, yeah, to, to control overfitting basically. So anyway, um, so you know all about this. So then uh, what we're going to next do is uh, we won't, we will process this uh, mince data. 
using, uh, so this is, yeah, this is the handwritten digit recognition. So it's actually a black and white image. And what we're going to do is, uh, this time we're gonna use read.format lib uh, SVM. So this data is in this lib SVM format. And then we give it the option number of features 780, and then we simply load this uh, text data. So we have training and test because uh, these are already broken like this. This is so. Uh, and then I'm going to cache the training data and the test data because we're going to reuse it. So we're going to cache it in memory. Mm -hmm. So now um, let's print training dot print schema. So we have labels and features. And if we just sort of do it like this, show three. This will make it quite ugly, I think. Yeah. Because there's quite a lot of columns, right? 780. So anyway, the false basically tells you to not truncate. But yeah, this is quite convenient in Databricks, so we can just display it. And it sort of shows it a bit more nicely. So these are our. Uh, so this is a sparse vector, unlike the previous dense vector. So. Uh, to encode a sparse vector, you need to know its total length and the indices where it is not uh, zero. All right, so these are the indices where it's not, not zero. And the value it takes is these, right? 318 to 16. So these are the gray level values it takes. Okay. Uh, so yeah, I'm trying to think of all this is what I'm explaining here. So here are the basic, uh, I'm mainly gonna give you syntax. So this is, you would import a classification decision tree classifier and decision tree classification model. This is what you get when you take this um, and, and fit it, okay? Um, so this is your transformer after taking the uh, estimator and fitting it. And then we will also need a couple of things uh, because we have classification problem. We, we will need this uh, uh, ML feature method called string indexer. And we'll also use the ML pipeline now. Okay, so the string indexer simply reads the column label um, and annotates it as a categorical variable, right? So set input column label, and then set output column index label. And so this is uh, essentially um, what this does. And then DTC is our immutable of a new decision tree classifier, set label columns to be indexed label. So then we can create a new pipeline and set stages. So in the pipeline, when we set stages, we give it an array of different parts of the pipeline, right? So we first have the indexer, right? And after the indexer does its job, uh, right? It's a, it's a uh, transformer, right? So it, it has this input column and it adds this output column. And then we call this, um, this decision tree um, classifier uh, to set the label column to be this one, right? So we just can chain them like this. That's it. And then let's fit a model to our data. So when we later on do examples in natural language processing, these pipelines will get much more complex, okay? But it's still the same idea. There may be more stages. Um, so then we can just fit to the training data, this whole pipeline. And, and then this is quite cute. Uh, you can basically, uh, take the you know model stages last as instance of. So this is basically how you would call the decision reclassification model that is the result of the fitting. And then you can display the tree and this should sh sort of show you, I mean, I don't know. It's very difficult to make sense of feature 350. <laughs> I mean, but it, it is, it's interpretable, but it's not intuitive. What's going on, right? 
but that's what it, it fitted. So here are the digits. I don't know if there's any, anything we can make sense here. Um, at least all the zeros seem to be on the right side. Um, yeah. So basically, next main thing we do is hyperparameter optimization. So here we're going to explore the map, map step. The main thing I want to realize, I want you to realize here, is that we we can do this uh, in a in a um, in, in, as part of the whole pipeline, right? That's what, uh, that's what, uh, what is this one? And this is what I was trying to show here. So here are pipelines for cross-validation and hyperparameter tuning um, all happens in one go. So uh, we set maximum depth to this and then uh, and then if you look here, um, here's my whole block. So between zero to eight, um, I simply go from zero to eight as my max step, and I call the same thing again and again, right? So I fitted the model. And then we want to evaluate this. Um, so we can use, uh, there is a multi-class classification evaluator, right? So we can simply call this method, um, set the label column to be index label and set metric to be F1. So we can use sort of the F1 metric. And then, um, I shouldn't have done the outer loop there, it was silly of me. So here we can we can actually um, after we do the the predictions because in the previous loop it just went through it kept on increasing but we we may want to uh, you know, do predictions uh, as as the fitted model transformed by the test data and then we can do um, max depth evaluator and evaluate uh, the predictions as something to report. So, so basically this thing will come in as our, um, yeah. So if we, if we do this show, the, the actual action is um, done and then we can see how the F1 uh, score is changing with depth, okay? So we can also, uh, explore this other uh, parameter called max dense, which is a uh, discretization for efficient distributed computing, because maybe we don't need all the, you know, all the um, resolution. Um, so we can just effectively turn into a black and white image um, with this max dense equals two. So we can play around with how much of the gray image is really needed, right? So this is again, same idea, except now I have a sequence two, four, eight, 16, and 32. And then I'm mapping the max case bins to set max bins. So this is basically, yeah, setting the maximum number of bins to, uh, to discretize the, the grayscale to fewer, right? So this is uh, another sort of hyperparameter you can call, and then you can combine the two basically. So, so you can see that there is not a big difference. So two, just black and white is enough for this, you know, because the F1 score is not really significantly changing, right? So these are sort of things you would do uh, to get a bit better sense and you can do them sort of jointly. Um, have a look at these resources. Um, 
So there are other parameters you can tune. Uh, you can also tune using cross validator, which is an, um, um, another approach. Here we just took one test data, but there is a uh, uh, cross validation uh, where you basically take the data and partition into different chunks and for each chunk you look at the complement and then you rotate around so this is done in a distributed way in spark uh, so it's another big advantage okay so maybe we will stop now um, so what we have done is uh, quite a lot okay but mainly at the sort of high level syntax and playing around with code starting with sort of low level uh, you know, operations on just pure text data, turning it into a case class and into a data frame. And then for the, for the handwritten digit recognition, we just loaded the data in a convenient uh, format that's sort of focused on uh, a more complicated pipeline where there are parameters we can repo. So later on, we will see more and more of this. Tomorrow, uh, I'm going to, yeah, go over a few of these core ideas, uh, but let you read in detail uh, if you want to get into the asymptotics of distributed algorithms. Once again, we will be a bit focused on applications. And I hope to go through power plant pipeline, and uh, we'll see how far we get. Okay.